This is episode 299 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point, New Mexico. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Grangmaster. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, more stunning news this week from our governor, who seems to have finally decided it is time to move New Mexico into a more open phase under coronavirus. Just not even two weeks ago, it was barely uh, uh, a week and a half ago, we were in yellow here in Bernalillo County. And now, with the exception of a few areas of our state, we are all in turquoise. And we'll talk a little bit about at least one of those areas of the state, but quite a momentous and rapid shift for uh, New Mexico. Yes, no, bat, no doubt about it. And uh, the interesting question, uh, two that come to mind for me is, what comes after turquoise? Uh, hopefully a complete opening. But Paul, uh, the other issue that uh, uh, in the back of my mind is bothering me a bit is we've seen places that have done very well and then cases go up a little bit. And uh, what would happen if that were to happen here in New Mexico? Are we gonna have a knee jerk reaction back the other way Heaven forbid we have another uh, two weeks to flatten the curve part two that lasts a year, year and a half. But right now, yes, things are open. Things are going in the right direction. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic is as good as I can be that this will be sustained uh, throughout the rest of this year. Yeah. And, of course, the uh, main concern I have uh, – is not that we'll have another outbreak in New Mexico. It's that vestiges of her order remain in place that I find uh, troubling and concerning. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. But uh, it is worth noting going through these uh, since just a, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, you know, when much of the state was in yellow, uh, I believe we even had a red county. Now, uh, we have 33 counties in the state. Everybody is in turquoise except Valencia. That is the county immediately to the south of Bernalillo. Uh, so Facebook and Las Lunas and those, you know, different, a lot of different businesses. It's a pretty pro-business uh, county. That is in green. Catron County, where I don't even know how they track this stuff because uh, <laughs> it is uh, where the wolves outnumber the people territory. Out and the cows outnumber the wolves. So, <laughs> exactly. yes, there's not many people in Katrin County. Yeah, so we're talking uh, you know, south of Cibola County, north of Grant County. Cibola, of course, being uh, you know, to the west of Valencia County and Bernalillo County, all the way to the Arizona state line. So Katrin is below that and north of Grant County, which is Silver City mostly in uh, yeah, Katrin is a relatively large geographical area, uh, very few people, and they uh, wound up in green. Uh, but the really interesting outlier is Chavez County, that's Roswell, is in yellow. And uh, I'm sure folks down in Roswell have to be just beside themselves in terms of where their county has been placed in these recent uh, reopening orders because it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, we've at the Rio Grande Foundation looked through these uh, you know, metrics pretty uh, thoroughly throughout the process, but you know, every two weeks you just kind of come out and see, well, okay, we're in yellow, we're in green, we're in you know, red, whatever, uh, and you just hope that things change. But I decided to really go into some detail here uh, on this one. So bear with me. You have three metrics, case rate. So, you know, it is a percentage, how many people tested get, have a, have the positive test uh, or let's see, that's positivity. Let's get the definitions directly yeah. because case rate and test positivity. Okay. So, Daily case rates, that is the number of cases plus negative tests over 14 days. Uh, and it says the target here is 
less than or equal to 10 for 100,000 people per day. Then you have test positivity, less than or equal to 7.5%. And then the vaccination rate, how many of your people, what percentage are uh, vaccinated. So this is all directly from the state's website. Now, uh, we have County X with a case rate of 28.8, test positivity of 7.4, and a vaccine rate, vaccination rate of 53.5. County Y with a case rate of 19, test positivity of 10.93%, and a vaccination rate of 23.4. County Z, 11.7 case rate, which is lower than the other two. Lower test positivity at 4.25%. We had 7.4 and 10.93 with a vaccination rate that is below county X and above county Y at 31.1%. Now, which one is oh, which one is which in terms of turquoise, uh, green or yellow? Yeah, I feel like you're Monty Hall, and I have to decide what, <laughs> whether uh, door number one, door number two. No whammies, no whammies. I think I'm going to just uh, to have an algorithm here. I'll go with uh, the middle county uh -huh. because their uh, vaccination was lowest. So well, that is Roosevelt <laughs> County, which is in turquoise. Okay. County X, I was, in other words, I'm wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> yes, County X with the very high case rate and relatively high test positivity, uh, but the high vaccination rate is San Juan <laughs> County. Of course, our friends up there in the Four Corners, uh, they are also in turquoise. County Z is our friends in Chavez County, where the case rate, test positivity, both lower than the other two, <clears throat> vaccination rate exceeding County Y, Roosevelt County, that's uh, Portales, and uh, below Farmington or San Juan counties. <laughs> So a, I don't pretend to understand the system and somebody on Twitter said that it has to do with multiple timing periods and that you're supposed to not rise and fall based on certain things. I yeah, don't know. And you know what? And I have heard that. And you know what? First of all, let me just say that I, I read your post with that information, that same information and I didn't get it then and I don't get it now. But yeah, somebody told me the same thing, Paul, that um, there's some delays and lags in certain information. So if you're in certain categories for multiple periods of time, it takes longer to go the other direction. But it, it, is, it is not necessarily clear. And uh, you know, if you're in Chavez County, you're probably not really happy about that. And uh, maybe, maybe, they, maybe the people in Chavez County uh, understand it because we've seen... A lot of counties that fall into the uh, bad color codes uh, try to figure out what they can to get out of it. Not necessarily on a practical, real basis, something that makes a difference, but I know uh, Doniana County was having problems with a uh, number of positive test percentages. So they just went and got a lot of people that were healthy to go get a COVID test. So it's, uh, do you think maybe the time has come for the system to be... Uh, Retired? Well, I think? think the time was a long time ago that this system, because it really never made a great deal of sense. Um, yes, it in some ways it was better to have a local variable, local control, but uh, it, it's long past time to reopen New Mexico. As, as I've said before, uh, these COVID restrictions really uh, were... A worthwhile proposition, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve, whatever you're going to do, do it when ho uh, hotels, hospitals are suffering from real crowding issues and you are attempting to conserve scarce health resources for an entire geographical area. When things are waning, when people have the opportunity to get vaccinated, not only should people be, uh, able to go back to work and go back to living normal lives. But like other states have done, we should be abolishing mask requirements indoors, outside, wherever they may be. And kids also playing sports with masks on shouldn't be a thing. Again, 
indoor, outdoor, you have it. Yeah, I, I, I think we are, are getting close to that as well. Uh, but I am not going to hold my breath on this. It just seems like there's too much, too much emphasis politically on these masks. And uh, uh, we've talked on the podcast, we see more and more politicians outside, socially distanced, double vaccinated, mm-hmm. talking on camera with a mask. So that's just, uh, you know, there's, there's this weird thing. This mask has become this uh, virtue signaling. And I use that word not even knowing what the heck that thing means because I'm not sure what the virtue you're signaling it is. But I'll just call it, a, I guess, political signaling is like, we like masks. We like government telling us what to do, even if uh, it's something that uh, they can't explain nor has been proven to be effective. So, Yeah, uh- Totally agree with you. Now, of course, while uh, our kids uh, are playing sports with masks on and uh, some exciting moments in the state basketball tournament, for example, from the last uh, several days, isotopes are playing and we're very happy that the isotopes are back on the field after something like 600 days of not playing baseball. So that's good. Of course, you go to a game and Despite all the science about outdoor spread of the virus, you're still going to be expected to wear a mask at the games. Now, the the situation, I'm sure the folks, and I can't imagine this had anything to do with the governor revising her orders, but just so happens that the United and the Isotopes did start their seasons uh, you know, very recently. You have a lot of summer activities coming along that... Uh, I'm sure the governor wanted to be seen as putting herself in in support of more uh, reopening of the state, its economy, uh, its restaurants, its jobs, of course, uh, and we're going to talk about it next. The still uh, significant challenges economically uh, that not just our state, but our country face uh, as we attempt to get out from under not just the virus, but I think more importantly now the restrictions that are uh, remaining. Yeah. And as we attempt to get out from underneath that and return to some sense of normalcy, we're, we're seeing that the government policy is hindering that recovery. Uh, the excess uh, unemployment insurance and because New Mexico had more unemployment, it would stand to reason that we have the problem that we got the, uh, what I'm calling uh just broadly speaking, as the COVID-19 hangover, these are all the things that are coming about. We have it worse than many states because we have more unemployment. And this started out as a pretty big New Mexico story earlier than nationally. So it kind of makes sense there. But this story is picked up on a national basis right now. And uh, the other thing that's kind of touching along this, and again, there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, unintended consequences coming of uh, what policy's been. Uh, that may be aiding inflation as well. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know, businesses want to hire people. You have employees that don't want to come back. So salaries are going up at the same time. Commodities are going up at the same time. There's lots of stimulus money in there, lots of dollars chasing, maybe not that many goods. So, uh, yeah, things, uh, it's it's shaping up to be quite a wild, uh, you know, to uh, use a Disney ride. Mr. Toad's wild ride is what I uh, think the economy is going to be like uh, for the rest of the summer into the fall here, because there's just a lot of, a lot of dynamics, uh, some of which we haven't seen in a long, long time. Americans have basically gotten used to living without inflation and we'll see how long it takes them to, uh, learn. The thing about inflation is it's, uh, it's a pretty, uh, Stern teacher, when prices are, of things go up a lot, 5, 10, 15, 20% in a year, it definitely will get your attention almost like nothing else. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're going to turn our attention here a little bit to uh, federal data, but also uh, touch on some state data as well. And uh, the uh, federal uh, data on unemployment just came out, it said that actually uh, unemployment ticked up. Now, it's not really a surprise in especially volatile economic times when uh, unemployment goes up or the number of jobs uh, miss their targets. But right now, we are coming out of 
what I would call the greatest intentional economic recession that we've ever seen as a country. You know, nobody knew what they were doing. Nobody understood the Great Depression. Nobody was doing it on purpose. If you talk to Herbert Hoover or Franklin Delano Roosevelt and said, do policies X, Y, and Z, and you'll get out of it, uh, they probably would have done those things. Now, uh, coronavirus was a different deal. Much of our country, uh, our job creation uh, was shut down uh, very quickly. And some states have been more, m more willing to reopen. Some states like New Mexico have not. That's why we have the third highest unemployment rate in the country at 8.3% as of the March Bureau of Labor Statistics data. But uh, recently, a national... Uh, national data came out indicating that uh, you were supposed to, or economists were expecting, a million new jobs to be added, and only 266,000 were. Unemployment ticked up to 6.1% nationwide. And uh, this has to be, in my opinion, a sign of people staying home, not getting back into the workforce. Now, we just talked about this goofy red, yellow, green sort of thing uh, in New Mexico, and I expect that that is part of the equation around the country as well, is that workers in their respective states want to make sure that the, you know, the coast is clear, so to speak, before they get back into the workforce, they give up the very generous unemployment mm -hmm. benefits and uh, go to work again. But... Uh, I, I do think that in most other states, coronavirus really is a thing of the past. In New Mexico, it's we're still kind of clinging to it like a yeah. like a blankie at bedtime uh, when we're 15 years old. But uh, the 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 question, and you see it here as well as around the country, um, but it seemed to have started here where massive numbers of people were looking for uh, employees, businesses were looking for employees and they couldn't find them, that I expect would cause inflation, but it's also causing uh, the continued elevated unemployment rate and the slow restart of the United States economy. And it certainly is going to be the same situation here in New Mexico. Yeah, and there's other uh, factors I do think that are in play right now. Uh, the other one I brought this up before is I do think the the child care situation, and particularly not that uh, the public schools are, are child care per se, but believe me, if you're a working parent and uh, of school-age children, you count on your children being in school and you not having to find uh, child care for them during the time of normal school hours, much less before and after school. And what you see around the country, you know, even in places like New Mexico, uh, uh, President Biden wanted schools to be open. Well, they're open, but uh, the number of people that are attending with uh, in-person learning is still quite, quite low. So there's these ripple effects that are there that I do, I think you're right. There are people that uh, say, yeah, I'll just, I'll wait. And, uh, you know, we're even seeing uh, places like in uh, the city of Albuquerque, the mayor says, we'll wait for you until September uh, when your uh, enhanced unemployment benefits run out to hire you. So yeah, will that be uh, the way it is across the whole economy? I don't know. But again, that's why I think we're in for a, uh, a pretty uh, volatile wild ride economically this, uh, this year in 2021 as we come out of the policies of the disease of COVID and deal with the aftermath of what happened uh, as those policies were implemented over the last year and a half, close to two years now. Yeah. And uh, to her credit, uh, Governor Lujan Grisham has uh, reimposed the work search requirement as a component of being on unemployment. You are supposed to search for at least two jobs, I guess, submit resumes. I've never been on unemployment, so I don't know. Uh, but it's uh, a couple of jobs a week as uh, a means of continuing your unemployment benefits. Now, uh, if, if somebody is genuine about looking for a job, there is absolutely no question that they can find a job. Now, how, how does this whole situation work? And can what accountability is there? You know, I, my 
job applications. You know, if, if we uh, are looking for jobs, Wally, and we send them only to the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Dallas Cowboys with maybe the L.A. Lakers thrown in there for good measure, uh, and they come back and say, sorry, there's no positions available at our uh, franchises for middle-aged white guys that uh, mm-hmm. maybe their jump shot or their 40 time is not what it <laughs> used to be. Uh, you know, the, the point is, is that how serious do you have to be about looking for a job? So I think there's, uh, there's reason to be con- re- reasons to be concerned about that. Uh, well, and, you know, and how serious pa- is. yeah. And one of the thoughts that came to mind is, uh, a uh, fictitious character, uh, Jimmy McGill from uh, Better Call Saul. You know, what would Jimmy do if he had to go out and do a couple of job interviews or try to get a job to get a, a something checked off on a piece of paper? Yeah, you can call around and uh, put out a bad resume, and maybe if they interview, you throw the interview. It's probably not that hard to do. I could be wrong, and again, I've never been on unemployment either, but... Um, yeah, I think that work requirement is not that's not too high of a of a it's not too high of a barrier that you ought to be out of that to get your unemployment, but again, I'm not sure that that's going to make all the difference either in terms of getting people rushing back in the workforce until their enhanced benefits go away. Now, getting more to the point, uh, a couple of states, Montana and South Carolina, uh, of course, they're red states with uh, conservative governors have decided to forego participation in the enhanced unemployment benefits uh, provided through Labor Day. Uh, They're ending that uh, as of June. And uh, I know Montana is... Are they just turning the money? I have a question, and you may or may not know. Are they just turning the money away, or are they going to reduce the state benefit by the amount of the federal coming in because can you imagine New Mexico turning away federal money under any conditions? I, I can't personally. Well, so. I know Montana is providing after I believe forty days they are providing a uh, uh, a one time bonus for people who get back into the workforce uh, over that time period. I don't know if South Carolina is providing any uh, bonus or any uh, additional money. I suspect that they are only foregoing the $300 weekly supplemental benefits under uh, the latest Mm -hmm. stimulus package. And I I suppose that uh, in the case of Montana, that they are able to repurpose that unless they're digging into their own state coffers, which would be somewhat surprising and really admirable. It's great that they're repurposing, if they can, those dollars uh, from the federal government. But uh, yeah, it's something that if you want people back to work, uh, you got to take those more difficult positions and, uh, and steps. Uh, now, the article I read about it is from May 7th of 2021. Uh, it's from CNBC. And unfortunately, they only rely on one uh, kind of critic or source. It's uh, someone from the left wing uh, Economic Policy Institute, uh, union-funded outfit, uh, Heidi Shareholds, uh, she said, it's breathtakingly terrible economics uh, uh, of these uh, plans for Montana and South Carolina. I would uh, disagree with her and say that the stimulus, quote-unquote, such as it is, is actually what's based on terrible economics, and that's what we're seeing across the country. But uh, sometimes these reporters and these articles are written in ways that you just have to wonder. Uh, the people being quoted are living in the same universe as you are. So yeah, uh, well, and that's one thing you've been around a while, Paul. I remember coming out of uh, bad, bad recessions where they would extend unemployment benefits because there were no jobs. True, you know, and so we are again. We're through the looking glass here. We are 360 degrees. Uh, we have lots of jobs. Lots of businesses that want to hire and just not many employees that want them. They want to be on unemployment. So uh, very interesting. And I, I'm with you. I tend to think that that uh, it the crazy economics comes from continuing this uh, plan, not doing away with it. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say that if you're vaccinated, you should be able to return to work. I think it's also safe to say that uh, unless – some other new strain of this virus comes along 
at this point, we are well into the uh, not just downward phase, but we are at the tail end of the real virus uh, as a problem situation. That's not to say that nobody will pick up the virus uh, or uh, nobody will have serious health repercussions uh, from it. But uh, if you've been vaccinated, uh, there's no reason to get not get back to life as, as usual. Now, uh, New Mexico did see some good economic news. We talked last week, and you know, there's been uh, definitely a, a lot of good things happening uh, around uh, New Mexico's economy. Uh, one of them that I don't think is going to get the attention it deserves is on May 4th, the Associated Press noted that New Mexico's oil and gas royalties set the highest monthly record. This is in uh, the history of the state. Now, these are state lands, of course, not federal lands under the moratorium. But yeah, but the, the lands, two are probably fairly well correlated because the, the feds haven't really done that much just shut off federal development, you know what I mean? And these are royalties well, the, the, going forward. The so. moratorium on, on drilling, now uh, how many permits that are still in the process right. or how many altered permits uh, we saw throughout that, uh, or at least early on, that the uh, number of drilling rigs was moving out of state. Now, uh, yeah, now, and they've recovered a bit recently. I looked okay. in, yeah, they're back into the, uh, I, I, I did a, heaven forbid, I feel guilty telling you, I did another podcast, Paul, without uh -oh, you. And you cheated I, yeah, on me. <laughs> I cheated on you. And, uh, no, and uh, drilling rigs were up, uh, you know, from in the 60s to the 70s. So there is. Now that's activity. in New Mexico. In New Mexico. Not on, not on federal no, land. No, not on federal yeah. land. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, the industry is doing very well. So what would you do with something like that? Right. Well, uh, let's tear it down. If you're Joe Biden, you tear it down. But the good news is, and of course, this is a real thing. Uh, it needs to be considered. Yes, about approximately half of our oil and half of our natural gas come off of federal lands as a state. But uh, the market, the formations, everything else is going quite well as it pertains to New Mexico. So if we have this political situation taken care of, but there's no signs of when it will be with regard to the moratorium. Uh, we you know, have the geology to really boom here in oil and gas production. So uh, like I said, the state land office um, and credit where credit is due, it is a seat currently occupied by a Democrat, Stephanie uh, Garcia Richard. And uh, her office reported $110 million earned in April, just April alone. And that is more than any month in state history, a 30-day month nonetheless. So I'm sure no. they can top it when they get 31 days crack at it. No, and you're right. It just shows, like you say, the power of the geology, the power of the technology. And uh, yes, uh, New Mexico is doing quite, quite well. And we'll have to see uh, if... Uh, there's a lot of policy, uh, you, you know, you al alluded to the, uh, the moratorium on permitting on federal lands. There's new rulemaking uh, coming out in New Mexico with regard to uh, ozone precursors. There's a new methane rule. You know, there may be some other forces in the other way, but yes, uh, we are back. Remember, it wasn't that many uh, months ago that... Uh, we had the uh, the spot price, if you will, of oil was negative, closing out some contracts in a month. And now yeah. uh, things are going, uh, the price is up there at a reasonable level. The drilling rigs are operating pretty well. And the money is flowing in for yeah. now. And uh, the article does note that the previous record was $109 million set in February of 2020. So it's obviously the, the month, immediately prior to the pandemic and a 28 day, actually 29 day, I think in right. a leap year there, right. but uh, clearly the number of days in a particular month are not dependent. It's uh, uh, just that these formations have been discovered in New Mexico and uh, the oil and gas business is strong in our state. It is poised to do even more for our state's economy, especially if we can get this moratorium uh, done with uh, on the federal lands uh, sometime in the not-too-distant future. 
But again, no signs as to when that will happen. And I don't expect Deb Holland to make a uh, particular effort to address that. And uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. It's, it's, you know, it's one of the things about oil and gas, uh, and I've talked a little bit about this to people, mo- mostly off the off the air. But uh, one of the challenges of the oil and gas industry and New Mexico as a whole is that oil and gas live, but marches to the beat of its own economic data and reasons. So you discover a major formation or formations. And production, tax revenue, all of those go gangbusters in spite of other policies that may be enacted, including a drilling moratorium, that are going to have negative repercussions. But uh, ultimately, because New Mexico is so reliant on this industry, it's really oil and gas that drives our state's economy uh, even above and beyond things like tax increases or regulations and the like. Now, it's been our strong contention that we need to do more to diversify our economy, but uh, unless you make a concerted effort and commitment, which nobody in New Mexico has really ever done, at least in our lifetimes, Wally, nobody's made a commitment to say we are going in a free market direction. Uh, we we just kind of live and die by oil and gas. And right now, despite political efforts in Washington and some at the state level, uh, as well, we are living pretty good thanks to oil and gas. Yeah, no doubt about it. And there was a time in the Richardson administration, similar forces. Back then, uh, natural gas was king. Oil was relatively low, so people wanted to drill for natural gas. So uh, what do you do? You create a lot of rules that make it harder to do that. And so while he's doing that, he's getting tons of money. The state's uh, coffers are full. So you're exactly right. And then the other uh, issue besides the geology, besides the regulation, is uh, what's the price of the commodity? And, uh, what if, uh, you know, in my lifetime that I've paid attention to commodity prices, whether it be copper, whether it be oil, uh, other other commodities like uh cattle futures or whatever, just when you think you have it figured out, uh, things can change in a big, big hurry. If you remember back uh, ancient history in 2007, I believe it was, oil's $150 a barrel. They start to write articles that oil will never be under $100 a barrel again for the rest of uh, rest of history. A few months later, uh, the economy crashes, oil prices crash, it's down in the 50s and 60s, and things are much different. So, you know, we could see we could see big rises in the price of uh, gas, or we could see uh, reductions. We'll just have to wait and see. But yeah, these, uh, these are all factors. We have uh, volatility on volatility on volatility is why this uh, industry is so uh, volatile in New Mexico. But also, as we said, there's... Uh, Nothing else to replace it right now, nor uh, do you have any indication of anything that I've seen for the uh, foreseeable future. Well, just to be clear, given free reign and political support, I I could easily diversify New Mexico's economy and make us a uh, a beacon of free markets and uh, success for the American Southwest and the country as a whole. Unfortunately, for the better part of 90 years and quite honestly our entire history as a state we've never had the political uh, wins and situation aligned to make new mexico a uh, you know a free market economically diverse state if we could we have so many advantages uh, we would be kicking Arizona's and Colorado's and even Texas's butts up and down. But uh, yeah, and look at Texas. Texas has a lot of oil and gas, but it's a it's as a percentage of their economy, it dwarfs it. Not because they don't have a ton of oil and gas; they have many times more than there is in New Mexico. It's because their other free market economic activities, uh, in addition to oil and gas, have done so well over the past couple few decades. Yeah, and. Uh, I don't need to tell you, but the weather here is way better than almost anywhere in Texas, unless you really want to get onto the beach in Galveston, which that is quite lovely, but uh, also prone to hurricanes. Well, Wally, last subject before we go, and uh, this one 
is a little complicated, but it is uh, something that is so critical. Now, uh, there is an article, and I will include it. I'll send it to you. Uh, basically, it's a Bloomberg article, Bloomberg Green even. So, uh, you know, it's not written by the Koch brothers or anything. Uh, it is uh, April 29th, Dave Merrill. Uh, the U.S. will need a lot of land for a zero carbon economy. And this is something that... A uh, lot spelled capital L, capital O, capital T, lot of this land. This is very true. Uh, now, the article does, I think, a great job of really illustrating not only how much... Well, it, it actually fudges, I think, on how much would be used if Biden got his way because they uh, talk about a lot of nuclear. They talk a lot about carbon capture, of natural gas and offshore wind. But here, here's, and, and the article is fully worth reading, some in, incredible graphics that they have in the article. Now, Wally, I've got to do quiz time again. What is, by geographical area, the most intensive energy source in the United States currently? What is geo the most geographically? So it takes intensive. the most land yes. to produce a given unit of energy. And just as a, as a, a clue, it's one or is is it a bright or a windy source? Uh, actually, it's none of the above. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, today, hmm. the U.S. uses, according to this article, eighty one million acres to power its economy. Uh, Fifty one point five million of those acres are used for this one form of energy, which I will give you the clue that it is put in your gas tank. If that doesn't, ethanol. Oh, so thank you. Yes, because yeah, outside oh. the, you know, outside the box, but this is, this is no, and that, that, no, it is. Yeah. It takes so, so many fields. And then, uh, if you, yes. Okay. So you tricked me. I <laughs> consider myself tricked. <laughs> uh, also, what uh, what form of energy takes the most water to produce? There you, go. you know, the same highly correlated. So, yeah, uh, using food for energy is proven to be uh, very successful for those that get the government subsidies. Not that good for the environment and uh, not that good for the economy. And, yep. uh, oh, very interesting. So you're talking um, you know, close to two-thirds of the acreage that you, is used for uh, generating our electricity and our fuel, uh, obviously that's automobiles, comes from uh, having to farm. And there are a lot of you know, people on all sides of the political spectrum that will say that the ethanol program is just a total boondoggle. Of course, there was a bill uh, in the last legislative session that would have required some form of new bangled fuel, the likes of which we don't exactly know about, that uh, would have been put into our gas tanks to create cleaner burning uh, uh, gas or gasoline equivalent. Uh, of course, whether that's actually clean or not is, is an open question because ethanol certainly hasn't proven itself to be clean in the exhaust pipe aspect, let alone consuming 51 and a half million acres of farmland and tilling that that could otherwise be left fallow or used for wildlife or some other thing. Now, I'm not going to quiz you on all aspects of this. Uh, <laughs> the second most uh, land intensive is hydropower. Now, I kind of give the hydropower a curve, uh, grade them on a curve, because yes, there are issues with hydro, uh, you know, dams on rivers. That, yeah, and do they do they count the whole lake or just that? You know, and it's one of those. It's almost like. You know, uh, it's like uh, Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the right. others, and definitely hydro almost doesn't belong on the in this right. rubric. Hydro is definitely a renewable form of electricity generation that a lot of folks can get behind, uh, certainly zero carbon. Certainly those dams, while maybe there's some econo or environmental harm with regard to fish, uh, et cetera, there's also a lot of recreational benefit and water stores. And, and, and of most of them were not built primarily for hydroelectric. Right. It was just a, something else you could, it, you could add on. So that was 8.7 million acres. So between the two of them, you're talking you know, 60 or so million of the 81 million acres of, you know, to power our economy. It's coming from uh, two kind of weird suspects right. there. Uh, with regard to the uh, the corn and soy growing for uh, ethanol, 
and you'd power. have to and you'd have to figure that that ethanol is not growth you know knock on wood hopefully it's not and hydro is n- you're not they are not building more dams right. to generate well i was i i was uh going to mention and i should mention that you know if martin heinrich or our u.s senators let's eliminate those two and just talk about our congressional re- uh, legislators up in Washington as a state, if they truly cared about New Mexico and the environment, they should be the leading opponents of ethanol in Washington. It's bad for the environment. It consumes all this acreage. And, oh, by the way, it actually impacts a business that does a lot for New Mexico, which is indeed oil and gas. But uh, I don't expect that kind of foresight from uh, especially our U.S. senators. Now, uh, and point- not many of those checks come to New Mexicans. None of them. We don't right, grow exactly. a lot of corn here. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All, all of the above. Um, 7.1 million acres for solar and wind farms. Now, this is where, if Biden's going to get his way, we're going to re- require exponentially more uh, surface area of our fine country to be consumed by uh, these kinds of things. Uh, then you go through... You know, power lines, uh, oil and gas pipelines, drilling operations, all of these are in the small single digits. In fact, uh, nothing petroleum or nuclear, nuclear 0.23 uh, million acres uh, in terms of its total consumption of space uh, with regard to the entire United States. These Fascinating stuff. I've really only scratched the surface here. But uh, they actually, uh, in this article, show maps of what it will look like. And they're, again, very generous to the Biden administration's proposals in terms of uh, how much land they will use. Uh, you know, entire states would have to be dedicated to energy. I'm talking like big Midwestern states, you know, Iowa, Missouri, and those kinds of We're places. We're not talking Rhode Island no, style right. states. So it's a, it's a piece that I will, like I said, include uh, the link to it. You really have to scroll all the way down. But you're talking about large swaths of our entire country that will be consumed, let alone you know, the battery powers uh, that will be, need to be developed and all the other aspects. Energy density isn't something we talk a lot about. We talk more dollars and cents and reliability and those kinds of things. But uh, when, you, when you talk about... Uh, the energy future of our country and uh, the state of New Mexico and its economy, uh, it's worth touching base on this kind of issue because uh, it affects us all. So. You know, and, and I have a copy on my, on my bookshelf, the Robert Bryce book, Power Hungry. That thing has held up exceedingly well in terms of uh, addressing these issues. You know, back when uh, wind and solar were just a small percentage of what they are today, he called out a lot of these issues. And we're going to see... Uh, whether the environmental movement, uh, what they feel about mining, because in addition to all this land, we're going to need an awful lot of mining. So you, uh, if you're against uh, fossil fuels and against mining, uh, your degrees of freedom and your alternatives go down really, really quickly. Yeah, uh, Robert Bryce is definitely somebody who's been a thought leader on the issue of energy density. He's spoken at least once uh, at a new number of... Uh, uh, Rio Grande Foundation speaking events. He's a, a worthy follow in terms of energy issues. And I think he's got uh, a new book that came out sometime during the pandemic, but definitely a, <laughs> a worthy thinker on these kinds of policy issues. So with that, we will leave it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to this show at Apple, Stitcher, or have your Google Home Play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path 3 Marketing for producing this show. All right.